Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Compassionate Cowgirl Show, where I teach you how to connect with your horse using compassion, innovation, and self-awareness. Now, this is part of the Mystic Experiment series, where I demonstrate these concepts using Mystic, who is a previously wild and untrainable Mustang from South Scenes, Oregon. Now, when horses seem unpredictable, that's, I think, what makes them the most dangerous. But their level of danger really has to do with the human and how well they're able to read the horse's emotions. Because before your horse actually goes into a reaction, he's showing you subtle signals of his discomfort and the emotions that he's going through that you may just not be trained to see yet. And I love giving this example. When Christopher Columbus first arrived on the coast of Mexico, did you know that the natives actually didn't see the ships right there in front of them coming in on the ocean because they didn't know what a ship was. They had never seen it. So this all means that when you're not trained, your eye isn't trained to see something or recognize something, then a lot of times you're going to miss it. So that's what happens with our horses. They're giving us some, what I would consider blatant signals, like a ship arriving on the coast that we're not seeing because our eye isn't trained to necessarily read the horse's emotions and see what you're going to hopefully learn to see in this episode, a horse going over threshold. So that's what we're gonna cover today. We're going to head to the office, look at the fear behind reading your horse's thresholds and learning how to read them before they react. And then we're going to head out into the field and see this in action with Mystic and actually really see these concepts in action with the mounting process I'm using with Mystic. So yeah, that's right. I'm starting to look actually getting on her back. Super exciting. And then finally, we're going to head inside for some tea time and we're going to talk about how this all applies to our experience here as humans and our own self-growth process because remember you can only connect with your horse as much as you can first connect with yourself. So with that I'm going to go ahead and read a testimonial and then we'll get started. This week's testimonial is from Cece. Cece has been an Academy member for as long as I can remember. She's also done the Five Golden Rules course and she's doing amazing things with her horses. If you follow her on Instagram, her account is Flicka the Free Pony. So I'll give you guys a link to that. And this is what Cece writes. One year ago, Flicka was wild. I took her from a neglectful situation. Flicka needed a lot of mental rehabilitation. She was terrified of humans. I remember one time I tried to lunge her before I knew anything about horse training and I just stood there crying because she kept bolting and freaking out. When that didn't work she kicked me. I was so confused. I had no knowledge of horse training and wanted to give up but then I found Mustang Maddie and finally everything started to make sense. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, CC uh, <clears throat> we, I really got to know her on her journey through the five golden rules and um, I see so much of myself in her um, and other young women who are trying to figure out how to go about working with horses. Sometimes horses can be really dangerous in a way that feels aligned with them. Um, in a way that really honors the horse and I know what it's like to feel that struggle and to feel like you don't know how to do something and you want to give up but there's something inside of you that just you just keep going <laughs> um, even after you get kicked and everything else so whew. anyways um, it's also sometimes I feel um, <laughs> like I can be a little bit disconnected um, from the impact that hopefully um, I'm making out there because a lot of my work with these girls has been online. I'm just really feeling grateful to be able to help and to see and realize that what I'm doing really is making an impact. So whew, thank you Cece, thank you everyone for your kind words and testimonials. 
So anyways, she writes, I immediately saved up some money and bought fencing to build a mini round pen and started Liberty Work. It was amazing to see the change in Flicka's attitude. She went from being terrified and broken to being free to express herself. And she obviously doesn't have an issue with that now. Flicka the free pony. Oh my gosh, I don't know about you, but I still have chills. Um, so thank you, Cece, for sharing your experience and for allowing me to be a part of your journey and setting an example for others that no matter where you're at, it is possible. So with that emotional beginning, um, what do you think, Turk? I think we'll go ahead and get started with today's episode on working with reactive horses and trying to see your horse's emotions and how they're getting close to threshold before they actually react so that you're both honoring the horse's emotions and keeping yourself safe. So I will see you guys in the office in just a minute. So as I was saying out there, working with a reactive horse, one of the biggest things that's gonna come into play is being able to read the horse's thresholds and be able to read their emotions so that you can respond accordingly before they go into a reaction. And that's going to not only help your horse feel safer, but it's going to help you feel safer as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at what exactly is a threshold. I'm going to read straight out of my five golden rules to the horse human connection course and I write that a threshold is the horse's physical mental or emotional boundary crossing the threshold causes the horse to go into one of the three reactions fight flight or freeze okay so the threshold is the absolute max that the horse can handle in any of these capacities be it mental emotional or physical and so when you pass this line of the threshold I see you going from what's the learning zone, which is kind of right in front of the threshold, into the reaction zone, which is when the horse is actually displaying fight, flight, or freeze. So these three different zones that you see are according to where the horse's threshold is. So if you're way below threshold, you're in the comfort zone where the horse is doing behaviors he feels really good about, he's confident with, requires very minimal effort. In the learning zone, more effort's required. He's having to kind of problem solve and think through, but he's staying engaged and he's okay with it. And and then when you go over threshold, that's when you go into the reaction zone and you hit the fight, flight, or freeze. So what happens here is this is kind of the fundamental form of two-way communication is that when you're asking for a behavior and you're getting close to threshold and your horse is becoming a little uneasy and showing you these various stress signals and you don't listen and you keep going and you go past the threshold, then the horse gets louder in communicating their discomfort and that's when you see the full-fledged reaction. So if you were to instead get close to threshold and see the horse giving you some stress signals, you would either stay there or go back a few approximations to where the horse is able to participate in the learning without that added stress and then gradually build their tolerance up. Now when we don't see these reactions for what they are, which is fear, we give them all sorts of labels and you know a horse reaches around to go to nip you out of fear and we label the horse as dominant or say they're being bratty or moody or things like that, which really prevents us to having compassion for where the horse is at and acting out of compassion and helping you know, the horse through that and recognizing that we've gone over threshold in some way and that the horse is reacting in a survival-based way. So it's really, really understand to not only identify the threshold and when your horse is about to go over it, but also recognize when the horse has gone over threshold and now they're in a reaction. So once you learn how to read horses in this way, it's gonna change the whole way you even look at horses. 
biases. It's crazy the sensitivity that you will develop, but you're gonna be able to see when a horse is uncomfortable before they're actually going into a full-fledged reaction. And your horses who may be you know, reactive up until this point, you may go back after watching this episode hopefully and see how you may have been going over threshold and how you can work it with your horse below threshold to slowly build their confidence in the behavior. So what I wanna do now is we're gonna head out with Mystic and look at Mystic in the field and how thresholds come into play and are coming into play with mounting. I'm gonna point a few different things that come up um, as Mystic gets close to threshold and really kind of help you guys train your eye to become sensitive to these small signals that the horse is giving us before they feel like they have to get louder in their communication to signal their discomfort. So with that, I'll go ahead and head out there and meet you guys in the field. to look at thresholds in action with Mystic now with her mounting work. The way that I have this set up is her mat is right there. She knows to stand on the mat and I'm just progressively going to move closer with the mounting block and step up on the mounting block. And I'm gonna encourage her curiosity about it right from the beginning as well, because it's kind of a new big scary thing out here for her still. Good. And so I'll kind of get her repositioned here. Mystic, target, good. That. Waiting for both front feet to be on that mat. And the first thing I did too was just Rub her for staying on it, click and treat, click and treat. That was the first approximation. Maybe rubbing and then going to the other side and rubbing there. And then just kind of building her duration, staying on the mat, even when I might step away. Good. So that was just in little approximations, I shaped that. Good, to where I could be back here, stay back here, wave my arms or something and click and treat and trying to click and treat before she moves. See how she thought about moving, but I was able to click before she actually did. Okay, so once that behavior was down, I started introducing the mounting block from a great distance and just picking it up and putting it down right there. So see her check it out, her ears perked up, she kind of raised her head. Those are signs of her getting to threshold. Right there, she didn't lift her head um, and her ears didn't fly up, okay? So that told me that she was already getting over that and we've already done a lot of these phases. So then I'll pick it up and move it maybe a little bit closer. She's still staying under threshold. And then I'll take one step up, click and treat her for that. And then maybe one, two, three. Now that's a lot of steps, but again, I'm watching her to make sure She's not going past threshold, meaning she's not holding her breath. She's continuing to chew. She's not lifting her head straight up. Okay, there she's just getting a little impatient. So I've rewarded her a lot for movement. So it's good that I'm going to balance her back out for just standing quietly, which is normally what I would start with with a horse, starting with positive reinforcement, is standing quietly and treat receiving mode. But with her, she was so shut down that I rewarded her a lot for movement, and so now I'm balancing her back out as well. Now, another thing that's gonna tell me if she's close to threshold with mounting is not only if she looks away, but if she looks towards me. So if I stay here long enough, see how she starts looking towards me and then I clicked and treated? Well, I was trying to not necessarily click and treat her head moving forward, but click and treat um, her before she walked off, okay? Because that's also a sign that she's getting close to threshold, is that if they're looking towards you to kind of guard their space. So see how 
then she's going to kind of move a little bit. Okay. Um, so that's an example of them maybe going beyond threshold. Okay. And also looking away from me because she's either looking, they can use both of those things when they're getting close to threshold. She'll look towards me and guard her left side or she'll look away in an effort to think about escaping, right? There, her weight kind of shifted back when I picked up that mounting block. So I'm not gonna take a lot of steps towards her with it. Okay, but these are all just little things I'm looking at to, for me to, yeah, I was late because I was talking, uh, for me to know that she's going uh, to get near threshold. But if I were to go over threshold, that's when she would leave me, okay? So the fact that you can do something at liberty means that, okay, you're staying within the horse's threshold for one, that's a huge part of it, and able to honor, read and honor and respond to your horse's emotions. It is reading your horse's thresholds and addressing them is the first component of two-way communication. Um, because they're communicating to you their fear, okay, and you're honoring it and not pushing past. So that is her guarding her left side. Matt, good. Okay, so when I was up in that position, I know that when I start staying here a little bit longer, she's going to turn that left nose towards me and want to get a little guarded. Okay, so I'll try to find a place to click and treat where she's offering me a clear presentation of her body again. Good. Good. Kind of get her straightened up here on the mat. But ideally I can find a place for her to be successful and click and treat before she shows that I'm about to go over threshold behavior because then I can end up clicking and treating her for the looking towards me. Good, good, good. So try to click and treat her. See how I tried to click and treat the moment right before she moved. And I'll count the number of seconds she can go here without moving. One, two, three, there she's guarding. That was a little too long that time. And that's interesting, she's kind of moving closer. So I'm thinking, I don't know how much of that is guarding and her looking for more reinforcement. Matt, good. Because I have worked with her getting a little bit closer. So let's see. But there, see how her weight shifted back. That was absolutely a threshold. So I'll keep just kind of moving that mounting block until I can kind of pick it up set it down and she's not moving. Okay, and then maybe rub here, and then click and treat, and then take one step up, rub, and click and treat, and integrate me getting up here, good, and actually touching her from the mounting block up above. So your horse seeing you from up here is a really scary thing for them. Um, really scary because this is not natural for you to be up above them and they feel a bit more vulnerable and it's just a perception difference, right? It's a good context shift. So there, as far as thresholds, I'm again looking at her face. Is she looking away for an exit plan? Is she looking uh, towards me to guard her body? Is she backing up kind of like she did? Is she there? She shivered. So instead of going to the third step, I stayed at the second. That's how I'm reading the threshold and then responding to it and honoring it. There that time she let, she was giving me the green light. She wasn't shivering at all. So I kept walking up. Good. Um, a horse getting close to threshold could get a little nippy right there. When I worked with Django and he would let, get close to threshold on the mounting block, um, he would have a tendency to get a little bit nippy 
before I ever even use the food, it's not about the food, it's about going over threshold, right? And then getting a bit reactive. So if her head kind of comes up, she's a little tense, etc. again, coming close to threshold. So what I want to do now is we worked on that a lot more um, continuously than I normally would. I want to do the A to B technique before I lose her and go back to something that's a little bit less stressful for her, a little bit of a higher reinforcement history that she has with it. And then we'll go back to the mounting block. Target. Good. 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 And when I come back to it, I'm not just going to go right up to the third step and say, well, this is where we left off, so let's start here. No, okay, I'm going to kind of give her a little warm up again. As I advance. So once I can get on that third step and touch her with one hand, maybe I'll go to two and keep rubbing, foot resting. What I'm also going to start doing is feeding her from up above because when I go to start riding her, I'll be feeding her from up here. Okay, and then this last thing I'm gonna do, the last approximation where she's kind of at right now, is start putting just a little bit of weight on her. Now, did you see her really kind of go to jolts there? Okay, um, the moment I kind of stopped rubbing too and went to put a little bit of weight on her, um, that told me if I would have kept staying there, she would have gone over threshold, okay? So, um, I am going to, I think that that's enough for this session. Hopefully you guys have a better idea now of how thresholds come into play with training. I kind of like that she stood staying there. I'm just going to reward that because I didn't technically ask her to come off the mat. Um, but again, if I would have gone over threshold those times, you would have seen um, a reaction in her leave the training session if I would have, and especially if I would have kept going over threshold. So that's one of the reasons that I love doing work at Liberty without any kind of physical um, attachments because it allows the horse to express their emotions fully and you get very clear feedback if you go over threshold. Um, not that you won't see it with the use of ropes um, as well but it is definitely clear at Liberty out here in a big field um, when they go over threshold. So hopefully um, that gives you guys a better understanding. And with that, I'm gonna give Mystic her end of session signal and I'll meet you guys uh, up at the house for tea time. So hopefully that mounting session with Mystic gave you guys a good idea of how to start reading your horse's thresholds. Now I wanted to talk about taking this a bit deeper and how to guide a horse through reactions and what that process looks like because I think that that is something that takes a pretty high level of self-awareness. So I've kind of organized this all out for you guys to help make it easy to follow. So. Step one is to have understanding for the fear. And step two is then to have compassion for it. But you have to have the understanding there before you can act with compassion. So the whole concept of this is that when you understand the horse's fear and respond with compassion, you can break the cycle. So if the horse reacts out of fear and then you react back out of fear, whether that fear is not just necessarily being nervous about 
about what the horse is about to do, but could be reacting out of fear by then trying to control the horse in any way. What happens is you just feed this reaction cycle. Horse reacts, the human reacts. Versus if the horse reacts and then the human can respond with compassion, then the horse will respond as well and you can break the cycle. If you think back to all kinds of thought leaders, their message was to never react back to a human, for example, but to respond with love and compassion. I have a few quotes for you guys. Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Matthew 26, verse 52, all who take the sword will perish by the sword. The Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, a violent man will die a violent death. And Jesus said in the book of Matthew, you have heard it that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So the message of all of these leaders was about when someone is reacting in this fear space to break the cycle you respond from a place of compassion. So much easier said than done, right? But I believe our horses are great teachers of this. So as we're moving into this, the two-step process, understanding and then compassion, as far as understanding goes, I'm gonna start with another quote. Understanding someone's suffering is the best gift you can give another person. Understanding is love's other name. If you don't understand, you can't love. And that was by Thich Nhat Hanh, I hope I'm saying his name right, from this little book. I love little coffee table books. So understanding with your horse that everything they are doing is either a result of a behavior that has been reinforced and it has a reinforcement history and it's an unwanted behavior of course but someone didn't realize they were reinforcing the behavior for example you go to ask your horse to back up and he lifts his head up and then you release the reins you've taught him to throw his head so there's a saying by bf skinner the rat is always right meaning the animal is just always going to do what they've been reinforced to do there is no ulterior motives which is something I love about the horses. They're just raw honesty, right? Now, the other reason they're offering an unwanted behavior is because they are reacting in fear, which we talked about, fight, flight, or freeze, right? But understanding that that's fear and not labeling it can be a challenge. So that is a major block to understanding because when we judge the behavior and put these labels on it versus seeing the fear underlying it, there's this block to understanding and a block to then connecting with the horse. So if we say that a horse who is going into a fight instinct is being a brat or he is being dominant and these kinds of labels, then we're kind of blocked from seeing the fear underlying it, right? And we're more likely to go and whack him or jerk on him and shank him or whatever it might be and just react back and feed the cycle. If the horse is shutting down out of fear and freezing and we're saying that the horse is just just being stubborn, he knows what to do, he just doesn't want to do it or whatever, then that's also going to be a block to understanding and then connecting with our horses. And we're going to be much more likely to react back and just whack the horse harder or whatever it is. Now here's the interesting thing, the more that we judge others, the more we're actually judging ourselves. So whatever we judge our horses for, whatever we judge other people for, it's always a mirror. And so if we judge a horse for being lazy or another person for being lazy, then a lot of times we judge ourselves for feeling like we don't work hard enough. And so you could be a total workaholic and work harder than anyone you know. You are judging someone to be lazy and then I were to say this and you'd be like, well, no, I work so hard. Da, da, da. And it's like, well, okay, exactly. That's the fear coming up that maybe you feel like even though you're working your butt off, you still judge yourself for not working hard enough. And hence, that's why you're a workaholic. And by the way, before we move on, if you guys want more information on that, The Judgment Detox is a great book that I really enjoyed on sorting out all of your judgments and how to really see them as a mirror for how much we judge ourselves. So I would would definitely recommend that book if you're interested in taking that further. All right, so let's talk about the next step, which is compassion. So understanding is really important for empathy, which is the ability to really 
feel what someone else is feeling and connect with that part of themselves and go there with the person. And compassion is taking it a step further and then helping to relieve that person's suffering, which sometimes when we're talking about you know people, it can help really relieve the suffering by just having that empathy and allowing them to talk and go through what they're going through and tell that person you're not alone. But anyways, compassion is more action driven. Now here's an example that a teacher explained to me that I think really helps with this. So the difference between empathy and compassion, if you have a plant, is is that if the plant is wilting away and dying because it needs sunlight, then empathy is just saying, oh, I really feel for you plant, like that's, that's tough, I've been there. <laughs> and compassion is picking the plant up taking it outside and placing it in front of the sunlight where it can grow. So how do we respond back to our horses with compassion? Okay, so here's how you respond back with compassion to our horses. So I'm going to use the example of the monster under the bed syndrome. So if you've ever had kids or babysat or have little siblings, I'm sure you've seen this before where the lights go off, nighttime comes, and the child is scared of the dark or mon monsters under the bed. So there's two different ways that you could approach this. If you take the route of compassion, you're going to validate the child's feelings, uh, your horse's feelings. And you take the route of wanting to block connection, it's going to be invalidation. So let's take a look at what those two look like. So invalidation, the child is going to profess their fear of these monsters and you are going to say something like, monsters aren't real, stop crying and go to bed and slam the door. <laughs> Okay, maybe not that drastic, but something along those lines. That's going to be invalidation. What happens is that the child feels wrong for feeling what they're feeling. We could also add in things like boys aren't supposed to be scared, that girls don't cry. So the fear goes on night after night because the child was never validated. And in this moment, there's a huge block to connection because we're not willing to learn more about their world and how they see the world. We're trying to impose our version of reality onto them. So here's what the opposite would look like. This is what it would look like to validate the feelings of the child or the horses we'll get to. When you validate their feelings, you're taking their hands and ears, you're looking them in the eye, and you're saying, those monsters are really scary, huh? Let's take a look at them. What scares you most about the monster? So this is a process of asking our horses, what is it about the tarp that's scaring you? Is it the noise? Let's cut that back a little bit. Is it the size? Let's fold it up and make it smaller until you're more comfortable. So really asking these questions of what is it about that monster that's scaring you and really going through the room, so to speak, and lifting up the chair, lifting up and peeling back the rugs, shining the light in the closet and under the bed, and really going through this process is what's going to help our horses work through our fear and help that child get to the point where they feel heard and validated and understood. The thing is, is a child doesn't know how to express that feelings of abandonment arise at night. So their way of expressing it is through the monsters. Just like we know that a plastic bag isn't going to kill your horse, right? It Just because we know there's no such thing as monsters and that the plastic bag isn't going to eat the horse doesn't mean that we have to act in a way that invalidates their feelings because the feelings for the horse as a prey animal is very, very real. Uh, putting a saddle on a horse's back, you're putting a dead animal on their back. So we have to be able to look at the world from their perspective to truly connect and help them get past this state of reactivity and fear. So when our horses are reactive, I'm not saying that we should avoid the thing that's causing the reaction, but instead we should be shining the light on those scary spots and asking them what is it about this monster that's so scary and okay it's it's the size of the object or it's how close the object is let's peel that back then and go to a place where you're not going over threshold and work in an area where you feel comfortable and safe and you can learn versus being in a state of reaction now here's a block to compassion and here's the trick as it applies to our horses as well because until you can have compassion for yourself, 
you can't really have compassion for another. So out of my favorite little book here, Compassion is the capacity to understand the suffering in oneself and then in the other person. If you understand your own suffering, you can help him to understand his suffering. Understanding suffering brings compassion and relief. Really, this component of having to hold compassion for ourselves before we're able to com hold compassion for others is what's so important here. So what this means is that you have to first understand how do you react out of fear? Do you go into fight? and go into a yelling match? Do you go into flight and leave the scene? Do you freeze and shut down and just kind of turn into the stone wall and go inside of yourself? How do you react? That's really important to understand. And then the next step is holding compassion for it. Can you hold compassion for yourself freezing up? Can you hold compassion for yourself when you snapped and lost it with a coworker earlier and went into fight? That is a really important piece because until we can hold compassion for ourselves in that moment, holding compassion for another human being or for our horses, is going to be really difficult. So I used to think that compassion for myself and this whole concept of self-love was really selfish and I didn't even like saying self-love out loud. I like cringed at it. And now I realize that having love and compassion for yourself is actually the most selfless act that you can give. So reading another quote, the author here recommends putting this commitment in words such as, I vow to develop understanding and compassion in me so that I can become an instrument of peace and love to help society and the world. Oh my gosh, shivers, like all down my spine right now. And I don't think it's because this fire is really hot. Um, but yeah, so really, it, it, compassion for others, whether it's other humans or ourselves, and stopping this cycle of reactivity, it starts with ourselves. That is the message today. So question of the day, what I wanna hear from you guys is how do you react? Is there one that you mostly go into? Like for me personally, I know that I freeze up and until I started developing compassion for myself for freezing up because there was a lot of shame around that. It was difficult for me to have patience with horses who had shut down. That was like the one thing that would keep getting me because I was judging myself for shutting down so I couldn't help but then judge them for shutting down. Our horses are our mirrors, you guys. And anyways, I wanna hear how, what reaction you go into. I call this exercise acknowledging the wild horse in you. How do you react? And also I wouldn't mind hearing how your horse tends to react as well if you have a main horse you're working with right now what their tendency of a reaction is i would love to hear from you guys and remember when you are vulnerable and you share your comments below you are helping at least one other person feel less alone on this journey and for that you could really be changing someone's life so thank you for doing it thank you for putting yourself out there and being vulnerable let's talk about for a second next week's episode in next week's episode we're going to be talking about how to use two-way communication to build trust now now, reading your horse's thresholds and honoring them and validating them is the most basic form of two-way communication. The horse is communicating something to you, a message, and you are responding back. It becomes a process of the horse communicating a message and being heard and understood and acknowledged, and then you communicating a message and being heard and understood and acknowledged. So that's the most basic form of two-way communication, but I'm going to be showing you guys how to take it even deeper and create what's called the start button technique so that you can give your horse this whole other way, unlock this whole new realm of your horse learning how to communicate with you. And that is going to greatly increase the trust of a reactive horse. So I'm going to see you guys not next week, but the following week on that episode. If you haven't hit the subscribe button below, make sure to hit that and the little bell next to it so that you're notified when a new episode is released and you don't miss anything. And if you want to share this with someone, if this resonated with you and you think someone else could benefit from it, I would love for you to help me get this message out to more people. And then finally, if you guys want to watch Mystic's Journey in more detail or learn more about positive reinforcement, reading your horse's thresholds and things like that, the Academy membership is a great place to get started and I'll give you guys the link for that. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and I will see you guys on the next episode. Have a great rest of your day.